Well, you are joining us for the continuation of our fantastic Deal Analyzer Week 2020. Throughout this week, we are celebrating the launch of the new Lendlord Deal Analyzing tool. And I'm joined all this week by Lendlord co-founder um, and CEO, Abiram Shaha, who's over there in Tel Aviv in Israel. Hello, Abiram. And today's special guest, well, I'm delighted to welcome back to Property Tribes, Mr. Anthony Ayton. And whenever oh. I think of the deal sourcing, Anthony, I think of you because <laughs> you are somebody that loves numbers, you love to crunch them, you know that numbers never lie. And, and we've, we've talked a lot about this in the past, but I think it's really interesting to talk about it through the lens of COVID-19. Um, Anthony, you are a landlord, you founded uh, Repolis, the deal sourcing app. Um, you've been in property for many years as a deal sourcer. Do you think that the whole COVID-19 um, pandemic has massively amplified risks for landlords and if they're not using these kind of digital tools then they should be? Um, are risks amplified? Um, risk is always there and you've got to remember that risk is related to reward. You know, you're a different person if you're investing in property to maintain a pension than you are if you're a person that's aggressively trying to make large amounts of money. One takes greater risk than the other. And I think that the thing about the uh, COVID pandemic is that because you've had massive state intervention financially in terms of propping up people's uh, salaries, uh, the current block on uh, landlord and um, bank um, uh, repossessions, we've delayed the, what the true picture is. And none of us know. So, you know, if at the end of the day you're a, a, a first timer going in with your only 20 grand, um, now is a tricky time to invest. And it, the, the, the risks, I would say to you, are far greater because you simply don't know. Um, I, I think when uh, we see the unwinding of the furlough and we see exactly who's got a job and who hasn't, uh, that's going to be one um, aspect of greater clarity for people. And, and the other is, um, you know, there's, there's a lag between uh, somebody losing their job and the point when they become a distressed vendor of property. Um, you know, nobody, nobody loses their job and then is repossessed the same day. It generally takes a period of 18 months to go through their savings, to go through their credit cards, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So all of these things will enable us to get a picture. Um, I think at some point next year, early next year, um, there'll be, a, you know, there'll be, um, there'll be quite a bit of churn and, and you're going to see people uh, saying, well, okay, there, there aren't the jobs that used to be at Heathrow. I live in West London. I hope to sell my property, see if I can protect some of that equity and move to Birmingham or whatever their life plan is. And yeah, it will be clearer then. Interesting. No, we've been talking earlier in the week about how it's a kind of artificial stimulus of the market at the moment due to the, the, the government um, measures. But you know, in terms of deal analysing, we're not sort of saying there's a right way or a wrong way to do it. Everybody has their own their own methods. Um, in your case, how do you look at deals? What do you mean when the deal exists or if I'm sourcing and, and saying, oh, I'm going to look in this area? Um, more what about if there's an actual property that you're, you're considering. Oh, if there's a property that I would be considering... Um, I, I would look at the likelihood of rental. You know, there's some parts of the country and some parts of certain cities where you've only got to dangle the keys for half an hour and you've got a tenant and you've probably got a choice of tenants. Um, and then you've got other places where, you know, for example, Easington Colliery in, in, uh, up in the northeast, um, the yields are insane. You know, you can get a property for 25 grand and you probably get £368 a month for it which gives you a crazy yield somewhere of 18%. But the house next door might have tin on the windows and it might take weeks to get that property let. So you're always balancing those things. Um, if I was sourcing a deal for somebody else, which I, which I haven't done for a long time, to be fair, uh, one of the best ways of doing that would be to ask a person that has no interest in lying to you about what they offer. So if I was looking to purchase a property in, an, in a town that I didn't live in and didn't know inside out for rental, 
I'm not going to ask an estate agent whether it's going to let well or not because he's going to tell me what I need to hear. What I'm going to do is before that ever happens, I'm going to go to a letting agent and I'm going to say, what properties are you looking for now? And, you know, I did this up in Hull one time when I was sourcing for some people and the letting agent said to me, do you know what? We are so short of three bedroom family properties. These are the postcodes that we need. If you give me that property, I can let it be this afternoon. Don't give me any one beds. You know, it's, it's that kind of thing. Don't ask the estate agent who's selling it to you. He's always going to lie. Even if he's telling the truth, you should believe he's lying. Ask the agent because that's the person you're going to be dealing with. And mm-hmm. they don't make any money for blowing smoke up your rear. <laughs> now, when we were talking um, before we started the call, you mentioned... Um, you know your method and you mentioned uh, you had a clean and dirty result and I was yeah, yeah, wondering yeah. if you would mind uh, kind of just saying that again while we're on the camera <laughs> okay when I when I first started um, uh, doing property sourcing for people um, because of my background I wanted them to understand really really clearly what they were getting into so that they could look at two different deals and they could go this deal is better than that deal because you've calculated these figures in exactly the same way. So what I would look at would be the yield in terms of um, what the property returned annually by comparison to its value. So if it's a hundred grand property and it's 10 grand a year, it's 10% yield. That's the most useless form of yield for discussion. It's meaningless. Um, a lot of people who are building uh, a portfolio are more interested in the cash on cash yield. So they're saying, well, okay, if I put it in 25 grand and this is what I'm extracting by way of remortgage on your likely valuations and I'm getting this amount of money back, then I'm putting in 25 grand in cash. I'm making uh, 7,100 a year. That's roughly a 30% cash on cash yield. That's very interesting for that kind of investor. And then you've, I used to put all of these down, by the way, so you could pick your, pick your stat. Um, but the other kind of, um, I, I had a bank client who was a real sticker for numbers, and we, we did eventually become quite good friends. <laughs> and um, he used to say, well, yeah, that's all very good, but I'm not going to get 100%. <laughs> um, uh, I'm not going to get 100% occupancy. Tell me, what I, well, tell me what the average occupancy is, and we work that out. And then tell me what the worst occupancy I could possibly expect is. And we'd work that one out. And he'd look at the three numbers. And he used to call the low one his dirty yield. and uh, Sorry, his clean yield. And the, the number that doesn't include broken chairs and window, window mending and costs was his um, dirty yield. And also within my yield calculation... I would also include the obvious predictable costs like letting fees, gas certificates. I'd, I'd put all of that in. It would all be added up, disc- you know, discounted from the rent received. Hmm. Fantastic. Well, that leads us nicely just to go to Aviram to talk about um, the landlord deal analyzer uh, in, in that context. Because um, Avram, first of all, I think we wanted to make it very clear that the deal analyzer is one small module of um, the entire uh, landlord portfolio management system. Um, We have also our prospect properties module and our tenant compliance module and all the other bits and pieces. This week we're mainly focusing on the the deal analyzer. But um, Anthony made an important point there. He said that people do look at multiple deals at a time. And essentially what I think you were saying, Anthony, is that people build up a pipeline and start to assess these these different deals and we just thought that would be a great opportunity for um, Avaram to talk about how Lendboard can actually become your deal pipeline and we thought if you could have a look at um, what Avaram's doing Anthony and we'd be interested to hear your feedback at what yeah, kind of course, yeah. you know, jumps out at you about the metrics it's delivering. Yeah so so first I think uh, a landlord is the place to store your existing properties and now with a deal analyzer you can also uh, store your prospect properties on the same place. Uh, you can compare them and you can see also how your portfolio might look if you now purchase uh, a new property. Uh, so if you can see now on my portfolio you can see your existing properties. Um, and with this drop down, if you stored already, property, you can add to the table and you can see um, 
how much uh, now competitive the bots for the entire portfolio value, how much you have in the model, how much equity you have. Um, if we look at the pool analyzer, then you can basically analyze a prospect properties, but you can also analyze the system property and see if it's like still worth to keep it for the long term. And one of the things we mentioned uh, was the occupancy rate. I think it's important uh, thing to uh, to look at uh, what you your metrics and how they will change um, if your occupancy rate will be uh, in a low rate or higher rate. And you can see that you can also play with this side. You can see with uh, the higher occupancy rate, uh, your return is higher, and uh, with the lower occupancy rates it will also impact your uh, return. So what might you be your kind of dirty occupancy rate, Anthony? Uh, it would depend, like for an HMO, it can be, it can be really bad. Like, you know, I've seen HMOs where um, they were filled on, we filled them on day one. And if, because this is something we learned along the way, that if we created um, an HMO where people were really happy and comfortable, that, and stayed for a long time it could be really really easy but if you had a bad tenant in there you could lose a lot of tenants quickly we didn't find them hard necessarily to replace but you lost the month each time you replaced a tenant with another tenant you know so um i mean to be safe really if you're like an area i know well burnley i'd say that if you said 90 percent you, you'd be in the right area. If you're much below that, you've got a problem with the rooms or what you're offering or how you're advertising or the mm -hmm. price. But that's that's a reasonable target. I hunt, you know, you get 100 sometimes, but that's just because you've, you've got a bunch of settled tenants who don't move for a year. Mm. Absolutely. And I think, you know, post-COVID, there is a question mark over HMOs and how desirable they're going to be because of the issues raised during lockdown in terms of social distancing. And, uh, you know, they, we've had reports on property clubs of tenants bringing in girlfriends and boyfriends uh, during lockdown or not adhering to social distancing or hygiene. Uh -huh. Um, so there, there is a question over HMOs and, you know, if you're assessing one um, a, a deal, you need to think about, uh, I, I would say, and I don't know whether you agree, Anthony, is, is probably to be even more conservative than you were kind of pre-COVID-19. Well, yeah, but I, I think there was a point, like we had um, a building that we converted up in Colne, which is near Burnley, and it was um prior to that it was um a residential nursing building and this was in the days like when um when the rules on hmos were kind of patchy applied differently across different local authorities so our natural inclination was hey let's go in there and make a 14 bed hmo we'll make like some money and we went for the planning and they said no on the basis of parking so what we ended up creating was uh i think it was seven um self-contained unit flats and they weren't as big as flats but when you have an hmo and someone's got a kitchenette and they've got their own bathroom if it's nice and it's clean and they've got enough space they don't care what's immediately outside their front door mm. you know that's a matter for you know that's between you and the uh, you know and the um you know, land registry you know what whether it's a building or not is when you've got people sharing kitchens and sharing bathrooms and i think the days of that being attractive to all but the poorest tenants are gone. Okay, so when you saw the the metrics that were th being thrown up there um, by Abiram, are, are there? Would you say there's some metrics that are more important than others, or should they be given? They all be given the same weighting, or it really depends on your strategy, your attitude to risk. Etc. Absolutely. Absolutely. It depends. It depends on what you're trying to achieve. You know, if your if your whole you know if the thing that got you into property was the idea of long term capital appreciation, and you're working and you've got a good job, then you know the idea of maximising yield isn't as important as that yield being safe and predictable. You might as well go for single tenant lets. And as long as someone's paying the mortgage that's not you and it covers all the bills, you don't really care about the extra 10 or 20 quid. Mm. 
if you're a person that's coming close to retirement, you're trying to replace your income, um, sweating, the, the, sweating the maximum from that asset on a monthly basis is extremely important. And it makes sense to not let a family house on a single tenancy because you're leaving money on the table. Um, and so I, I think understanding those things, you, you're going to have a different value in, in, in different metrics. I think it's about consistency. If you're dealing with different property sources, it's about understanding that if one property source says to you, I've got a property, it's 10% yield, that you at least have the tools to say, well, what exactly does that mean? Mm. You know, you don't then turn to a sourcer like me who says, I've got an 8% yield and go, well, I'll take 10 over the 8 because my 8's a dirty 8, a clean 8 rather, and his 10's a dirty 10, which might work out to be a 4. That, that's and such that, that's a valid point. point, such a valid point. So we've identified straight away there that this tool could be used to, even if you're having somebody else source your deals to actually check their maths and do your own estimates based on your feeling about risk, etc. Because clearly, you know, a deal source is always going to give you the headlines. And, you know, it's, it's, we keep saying it's so much like it's the difference between, you know, reading a book about um, how to sail a boat and actually being at the helm of a boat. One's kind of theory, the, the other is practical. Um, and in property, you, you've got to have both sides. You can't just you know, look at, look at headline um, metrics. You've got to really, really understand uh, the impact of every different aspect of the deal on, on how that deal's going to pan out for you in the future. Um, Avram, uh, you were showing us there the, um, the long-term assumptions uh, op option as well. Um, you know, Anthony said that many, you know, the average landlord in the UK is in property for the very long term as a, as a pension hedge. And that's a useful uh, aspect of the tool for them as well, isn't it? Uh, correct. Yeah. So uh, the user can create his own assumption. Uh, we put our default. Uh, but you can play with that, with that. And you can change your uh, assumption for property appreciation, rent appreciation, and you can see how it impacts the long term and also the information. And you can also play with uh, the term, how much, how many years you want to hold this property. Um, and if I will switch the mortgage to capital and interest, you will see also the mortgage balance going down over the years. And you can also see the breakdown and you see your equity going up over the years. Yeah, no, it's fantastic. And I think we're seeing there that just by tweaking some of the inputs, you can see how it impacts on, on the deal. And I think it's quite healthy, wouldn't you say, Anthony, to actually, you know, dive into a tool like this and really see how, uh, you know, the interest rate or uh, whether it's interest uh, or interest and repayment mortgage or, you know, you can actually play around with it. Um, and in a way, it will kind of help you customize things to to your, your kind of comfort level of, of risk as well. Because if you, you know, you might see that if you put in, you know, another 10% uh, deposit, that that makes a more comfortable monthly payment for you as a for instance. Yeah, and another big for instance is, I don't, I don't know now we're talking about the lowest uh, interest rates on record, you know, for 500 years, but um, we should always be mindful that um, there's only one direction really for them to go from here, um, I'd have thought. And, um, you know, like you and I both know somebody who I won't name who had a big portfolio of new build properties, but most of those properties were slightly underwater, but that person made enough money that they were able to hang on to it and justify it and, uh, and, and sell out and actually make a big capital gain. But there was a point where this guy was putting in about two and a half grand a month into a property portfolio where rentally it was offside. Now, uh, what I would suggest for or what I would suggest for most investors here is that they have an idea, you know, the thing that the Bank of England does, um, you know, that you go, well, let's stress test it. What is the least 
occupancy that I can deal with? What is the worst interest rate that I'm prepared to deal with? And that might give you an idea of when you might want to go to the bank and go, do you know what? Yes, there is a cheaper interest rate available, but I know I'm never going to struggle with this. Let's fix it for five years rather than maintain the risk of, of future payments that I can't afford. Mm, no, that's a very good point. So um, just really as, as we wind this up now, Anthony, what's your view on digital tools like this deal analyzer that we're presenting um, this week? Um, do you think that landlords should be adopting what we're calling a digital first approach um, to help mitigate risk and you know to really understand their portfolios um, from every angle I think it's it's so much more well it's always been important but now so more than ever because oh, absolutely. I mean, the first thing the first thing I thought when I had a play with it was this is very like the excel spreadsheets that I um, you know that I used to make when I was sourcing deals for clients because people go oh yes but I want to understand this and I very and I had to always lay it out so that the same things were in the same place and then people would look at my sheets and go oh okay then so if I put 25 grand in I can expect to get this at the end of the year that if it's a bad year you know and they could work things out I, I think it's not it's not the digitalness of it that's important it's that you must understand these figures mm. if you didn't if you understood the figures and you did it all by penciling on, on an abacus you know you're not going to have a problem mm -hmm. it's when you don't understand the figures or you only look at two figures um and you're not really you know things things will come as a surprise to you at that um the good thing about uh taking a tool like this and playing around with it is that those are the figures that I would be looking at and those are the figures that everybody should be looking at. So if you play around in that tool, you're looking at the right figures. Well, that's very kind of you to, to say that. We appreciate that feedback. Um, have you got any closing remarks, um, Aviram? Um, first, thanks for Anthony for the great insights. Um, and I think this is it. Like, this is the, this is the uh, With this, you can understand the figures. And then you can make better decisions based on data. Mm. And, uh, this is like this is the important thing with launching these two. Um, so yeah. Fantastic. So the, I think the sound was a little bit uh, a bit off there, but um, Avram was saying that these uh, our tool basically helps people make better decisions because they've got an informed view of um, how the property is going to perform uh, by all the different metrics that the tool delivers. So uh, we hope you've enjoyed that. Um, it's so interesting. All the interviews we've had this week, um, it's always thrown up different different things everybody's got a different angle on it um very interesting to hear uh, your in your insights anthony thank you very much for joining us here on the call um all the best with your um endeavors i know you've got many different business activities going on um but you've always been a great contributor to property tribes and we do appreciate uh, you joining us today but for now we're all saying bye-bye and uh, go and have a play around on, on the Lendlord software and uh, see, see how it changes when you input the different bits of information. It's great fun to, to use all the sliders and look at interest rate rises and things like that. It's all there at your fingertips. Mm -hmm.